Number 10, starting off with this one, trepanation. Someone had to make this stuff up. Someone had to be the one that said, hmm, I don't know how to solve this, so here's something that we can do in the meantime. What was it? A hole in the head. This treatment can be traced back all the way to the Incas. After a skull was found with a deliberate hole in it in 1865, it was brought to the New York Academy of Medicine. All the way up into the 19th century, even though doctors knew how dangerous it was, this method was practiced to alleviate a whole bunch of things. It was even used in medieval times to help expel the humors from the brain. Like I know people were hard and fast about their faith back then, but I would have been terrified to go to the doctor. The practice was so dangerous that there was a joke that the surgeon himself must have fallen on his head. It remained a common procedure for head wounds despite the incredibly high mortality rate. Today, Hey, doctors still drill holes into the skull in order to access it for life saving surgeries, but trepanation is not really practiced now, thank goodness. But mm -mm, imagine a doctor trying to convince you that it's a great idea when you like your neighbor died from it. Coming out of the nine now, we have Marcel Patois, also known as the Butcher of Paris. This doctor was famous for helping the poor in Paris during the Second World War and for helping persecuted Jews escape the Nazis. Good guy, you might say. Well, people thought he was until March 1944. That's when police followed a foul stench all the way to his home and found it to be full of bodies. They were strewn across the floor in various stages of decay. Some of them were even cut into pieces and placed inside bags. He had been taking in Jewish people and murdering them after promising to help them escape to Argentina. He would tell them they needed vaccinations for when they were there and then would then inject them with cyanide. Moving on to number 8 now, we have Farid Fatah. This Lebanese doctor told over 500 of his patients that they were sick and dying when they actually weren't. He knowingly misdiagnosed them with diseases so that he could put them through expensive chemotherapy sessions and then cash in on that money. Horrific, right? Well, it gets even worse. He would also tell his patients who were actually terminally ill that they could get better if they just had a few more of those expensive sessions, even though he knew that the likelihood of their survival was almost zero. When police finally caught him, he was sentenced in 2015 and given 45 years in prison. Next up at number 7 now, we have Kim Tut. This 34 year old woman was told by her doctor that she had cancer in her jaw and that she had just 3 to 6 months left to live. She was shocked, but the doctor said they might be able to give her an extra three months that she could spend with her sons if they operated on her to remove the tumor. She agreed to the big surgery. They ended up removing the left side of her chin all the way up behind her right ear. A few months later, she was called in to see her doctors, who told her there had been a mistake. They had actually mixed up her biopsy with someone else's, and she never had cancer in the first place. Although she was obviously happy to know she wasn't dying, she ended up suing the doctors for medical malpractice. Coming at number six now, we have H. H. Holmes. Also known as Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, this American serial killer is thought to have been responsible for at least 27 murders during the late 19th century. While studying medicine, he would steal bodies and disfigure them in order to defraud life insurance companies. He eventually started up a hotel in Chicago, which later turned out to be a torture chamber with rooms and contraptions designed to kill the people who stayed there. He would then strip the bodies of flesh and make skeleton models out of them. He was caught and hanged in 1897 at the age of 34. Next up at number 5 now guys, we have Jayant Patel, also known as Dr. Death. This Indian doctor is thought to be responsible for the death of 87 of his patients between 2003 and 2005. Now the majority of these cases were not thought to be malicious in nature and were instead due to Patel's complete incompetence and total lack of medical knowledge. Many of his qualifications were based on documents that he forged himself. In 2010, he was found guilty of killing several patients through medical malpractice and sentenced to 7 years in prison. Coming in at number 4 now, we have Benjamin Horton. In 2007, this air force veteran was set to have his testicle removed after doctors feared it was showing early signs of cancer. After the surgery, Benjamin discovered the worst possible news, they had removed the wrong testicle. At first he thought this was some kind of joke and then the shock hit him and then he thought, what do I do now? Well, it turns out that legal action was what he did next. He asked for $200,000 in future care needs and unspecified damages. Next up at number 3 now, we have Dr. Margaret Bean Bayog. This Harvard psychiatrist treated Paul Lozano, a medical student at the university who came to her for help with his depression. She put him through her program known as Reparenting. It involved Paul reliving his childhood in the hopes that this would uncover the deep source of his depression. It was very strange stuff. It started with her reading him children 
children's stories, calling him baby and making him call her mother. She told him to break contact with his real family as well. The treatment took a disturbing sexual turn when the doctor told Paul to take out her breast from her bra cup. Other doctors found out the true nature of their extensive sexual relationship much too late. Five years later, Paul sadly committed suicide. Moving on to number two now, we have Alexander Bays. This man was a former Mr. Mexico and decided to get pec implants in 1999. He approached Dr. Reynaldo Silvestre to perform the surgery. However, when he woke up, Alexander found that he hadn't been given pec implants. The doctor had actually given him breast implants, a C cup to be precise. When police investigated the case, they found that Reynaldo had been performing these botched surgeries for years, charging three or four thousand dollars for each one. The icing on the cake was that he wasn't even a proper doctor. And finally, at number one now, guys, we have Dr. Linda Burfield Hazard, known simply as Dr. Hazard to her patients. She somehow got a medical license despite never actually graduating from medical school. Her method for curing her patients' diseases was starvation. That's it. Whatever it was, from a cold to cancer, Dr. Hazard would restrict their food in the belief that fasting could cure all ailments. The average diet would include two bowls of tomato broth and two small oranges a day. That's it. That's all they got. This would last for up to a month. In 1912, she was sentenced to two years in prison for manslaughter after one of her patients died of starvation, weighing just 50 pounds at the time of her death. Incredibly, Dr. Hazard died in 1938 while attempting a fasting cure on herself. Yeah. I think that proves once and for all that starvation is not really a good medical practice. Number 10, hysteria. I've been waiting a long time to talk about this. Okay, so technically the treatment ended up being a good thing, but it admittedly, it was more the condition they lied about. As a hint to where this is going, hysteria comes from the Greek word hystera, which means uterus. By the end of the 19th century, 75% of women in America were diagnosed with hysteria. It was a term to describe a condition where an excess of emotion led to an out of control behavior. Symptoms included shortness of breath, anxiety, forwardness, irritability, agitation, insomnia, and even sometimes hallucinations. So, in other words, a very, very bad mood. <laughs> One of the treatments used to remedy this were pelvic massages to achieve a hysterical paroxysm in order to stabilize and de-stress the patient. In today's terms, we call that an orgasm, which was something hysterical women didn't get a lot of or women around that time in general. Pelvic massages have been performed as early as ancient Greece to cure the wandering womb, a fictitious condition where women's wombs would were autonomous and would wander into their shoulder, for example, making it sore. The treatment was so popular, doctors finally thought it was time to invent a device who could do it for them. So they invented a device that vibrated in a particularly efficient way to achieve the result. The device remains very popular today, but the term hysteria has been debunked as an umbrella term to describe a multitude of actual disorders and conditions. Number 9. Fever Therapy So imagine someone saying, hey, so we see you have hysteria, so we're going to infect you with scarlet fever to see if that makes that better. But then of course, even if it did miraculously work, you still have scarlet fever. I don't understand. That is a very poor example to illustrate a very poor medical treatment, but it was actually a real thing. Some doctor, again, was at a loss for ideas at some point, so they infected a patient with something they could cure and it caught on. That's what I think anyways. Fever therapy was a very real therapy that goes back even to the ancient Greeks. They observed that a period of fever sometimes worked to rid people of other symptoms. But it wasn't until the 1800s that doctors decided to use it to treat mental illness. Julius Wagner Jareg infected a patient with syphilis with malaria to help cure the psychosis caused by syphilis. Though it did bring the patient out of delirium, it didn't cure them of either diseases. Now they've got malaria too. Good job. Though it is true that fever is a part of our body's defensive procedure when it comes to fighting disease, but uh, nowadays it's like having a fever means it's a bad thing. It is no longer used as a therapeutic cure. Imagine a doctor saying that to your face, like, hey, you've got this deadly disease, but we think this this other deadly disease might cure you. Number eight, dinitrofenol. You would think that the logical next step after encountering a drug that kills people is to avoid using it at all costs especially for like medical practices. Dinitrofenol was discovered in World War I by munitions workers who died after contact with 
with it. But scientists were like, nah, this probably isn't so bad. They discovered that in a 3 to 5 milligram dose per kilogram of body weight, it could actually increase the body's metabolism by 20 to 30 percent. A potential aid in helping obesity, yay, a miracle weight loss drug. However, it worked so well that the dosage just kept creeping up. Patients started developing high fevers, 109 degrees Fahrenheit for instance, heavy sweating and hypoxia. Due to its highly toxic effects, the chemical fell out of favor. It is now primarily used as a pesticide and in shellite a mixture used for explosives. So I don't know why that ended up in our bodies at one point. But all to lose a couple inches, eh? Great. Uh, number seven, Vioxx. Vioxx was one of the largest drug recalls in history. Because of this recall, the FDA and Merck, Vioxx's producer, received harsh criticism concerning their approach around potentially dangerous substances. The drug was used as an anti inflammatory that was used for people with arthritis. But soon, researchers discovered that it increased the chance of heart attack and stroke. By soon, I mean after over 2 million people had already used it. Over 140,000 people suffered from coronary heart disease because of Vioxx. Both the FDA and Merck were accused of ignoring evidence that said that this was what Vioxx could cause and each settled for $4.8 billion. Number 6, John Bodkin Adams. No one saw this coming, why would they? Doctors are heroes, which is true, but there are those who abuse power and unfortunately many of them are very good at lying, such as Dr. Adams. Dr. Adams was a general practitioner in the community of Essex, England. Everyone loved him and he was especially competitive passionate towards elderly patients. However, he would often prescribe risky drug treatments and he was strangely involved in his patients wills. Yeah, you can see where this is going. In 1956, police finally grew suspicious of Adams as they found several patients who had willed him large sums of money. They found dozens of suspicious cases but he was only charged for two. But even despite that, it wasn't the mysterious deaths that brought him down, but the forged prescriptions and medical forms. But the worst part about this case was that Adams was actually reinstated in 1961 and was able to reopen his practice. After all this, great. I don't know who's worse. The people who allowed him to like continue practicing or Adams himself. Number five, Marcel Petiot. In this case, it wasn't so much what he did in his practice, but what he did outside of it. Petiot was a highly intelligent child, even besides his, you know, some would call unusual behavior. He was expelled from school multiple times and arrested by the time he was 17 for mail fraud. He was never tried though as he was deemed mentally unfit. He then joined the army but then was discharged for thievery and mental unfitness as well. But he did turn it around for a time by earning a medical degree and becoming a decent doctor in Villeneuve, France. Until two of his patients died mysteriously or were murdered. He was never charged. He moved to Paris in 1933, continued practicing, then World War II hit and France became occupied by Germany and he had an awful, horrid idea. Disguised as a member of the resistance, he offered help to Jews looking to escape. Once alone, he injected them with poison saying that it would help protect them against disease while they traveled. After he watched them die, he stole all of their money and belongings. After the liberation of Paris in 1944, 30 corpses were found in his basement, though he admitted to killing 60. He was guillotined in 1946. Good riddance. Number four, Lyme disease. This is a weird one. Lyme disease is a very real tick-borne illness that for some reason is incredibly difficult to diagnose, to the point where some doctors just dismiss it right away. Canadian singer and icon Avril Lavigne has been very vocal about her experience with Lyme disease and the difficulty that she had getting diagnosed. She told Good Morning America that she saw several doctors and stated, I was in Los Angeles, literally like the worst time of my life and I was seeing like every specialist and literally the top doctors. But still, it wasn't until she actually went to a specialist that she got properly diagnosed. They told her that she had chronic fatigue or depression or that she was simply dehydrated and exhausted from all the performing or that she had the flu. Anything but the actual disease. This apparently is a very common occurrence with people who have Lyme disease. If a doctor is not familiar with the territory and doesn't know what signs to look for, then they just hand out a blanket diagnosis. Even Daryl Hall from Hall and Oates had the disease and was told it was just a flu until he was finally diagnosed after talking to family members who had Lyme disease. Be careful, if you've been around ticks and you've gotten any of these symptoms, 
Tell your doctor. Number three, Titicat Follies. That is the name of the documentary that uncovered the horrendous treatment given to patients at Bridgewater State Hospital. Filmmaker Frederick Wiseman observed the hospital for 29 days, all the while filming the harsh, cruel treatment by the correctional officers. One inmate was a paranoid schizophrenic who came there to be tested but ended up staying there. Despite complaining to the board that he was going through some pretty ill treatment, his case was dismissed and was given tranquilizers to keep him down. He wasn't the only one who was treated poorly like this. The documentary highlighted how unaware doctors were of the proper treatment appropriate for the mentally ill. Some patients were starving, scolded, beaten, and otherwise neglected. This is one example of poor treatments in asylums with a history of treatments that involved binding, starvation, simulated drowning. It is obvious that doctors had no idea what to do, so they either did nothing or tormented the patients. Thankfully today, mental health is taken a lot more seriously and is treated with care, but there is still plenty more to do. Number two, DES. Trigger warning for the next two, they do deal with uh, pregnancy and miscarriage. As a reminder, the 1950s didn't have the same rigorous testing that we have now, but that's not really an excuse. DES was prescribed for over 30 years as a way to help prevent miscarriages and complications during pregnancy and childbirth. At the time, doctors believed that some women didn't produce enough estrogen for safe delivery which wasn't the case. So DES, a synthetic form of estrogen, was made to combat this. But research revealed it wasn't effective for one, but doctors still prescribed it, even though they knew it wasn't really effective. Like we need more estrogen, man, we don't. Finally, in 1971, the FDA released a drug bulletin warning that the drug causes a rare form of vaginal cancer. The Supreme Court of California ordered all DES manufacturers to pay a settlement proportionate to their share of the drug market. And last but not least, number one, thalidomide. Thalidomide was first introduced as a medication in the 1950s to help control symptoms of morning sickness. But now that aging thalidomide generation faces skyrocketing medical bills as it was soon discovered that the drug was extremely harmful to infants. Common side effects included the absence of arms, deletion of ears, deafness, defects in the femur and tibia bones, and many, many more. Tens of thousands of children across the world were born with these defects as a result of this drug. What was first advertised as the most versatile drug soon became a heartbreaking scandal. According to the BBC, as of 2011, fewer than 3,000 are still alive. Which is funny, I was actually speaking to my dad on the weekend about this, and he remembers when he was a kid, my mom as well seeing so many thalidomide babies in their school. And he was like, now as an adult, I never see them, and this is why, because most of them didn't survive very long. Though compensation was dealt out, many survivors got little to nothing to help. But a possible link to a World War II German war criminal could bring more compensation. That's right. German scientist Shami Grunenthal was said to have first patented thalidomide, but it was recently confirmed that the German brand name was owned by a French pharma company that was under control by the Third Reich during World War II, meaning that it might have been developed in prison camps. And they marketed this drug to people across the world for anyone to consume. Even scarier, the thalidomide is still used to control serious types of cancer and leprosy to this day. It's still being used. Starting off at number 10 now, we have John Bodkin Adams. This British doctor goes down in history as a suspected serial killer. Between 1946 and 1956, over 160 of his patients died in suspicious circumstances. Almost all of them left him large sums of money and items in their wills. It's suspected that he coerced his patients into putting him in their wills and then intentionally shortened their lives through very high medicine doses in order to get that payout. The police were convinced he was guilty, but when it came to court, the prosecution was unable to get a guilty verdict, and Adams walked free and even continued to practice medicine. Number 9. The Placebo Effect the mind is a powerful thing. It can tell you something is really wrong, or it can lie to you. Which is one of the reasons why doctors sometimes prescribe placebos. They take advantage of the power of suggestion. In a study for the journal PLOS1, out of 783 doctors, of which 71% were registered with the UK's General Medicine Council, 97% said that they had used substances or methods that lacked therapeutic value, aka they prescribed placebos. 
placebos. Only a tenth said that they were actually upfront about it, but half said that the therapy helped many other patients. Some placebos included vitamin C for cancer, saline injections, and sugar pills. The effectiveness of placebos, if it is a psychological issue, only works as well as the patient believes it will. But bottom line, prescribing something that you know has actually no value is unethical. One of the worst cases actually happened recently. An anti-vax German nurse gave over 8,000 people saline instead of the vaccine to give them a false sense of immunity because they just didn't believe in it. Number eight, Fen Men. Everybody wants a quick fix but they are rarely ever real. The first diet pill hit the market in the late 1800s and today, the weight loss industry is valued at over $60 billion with a large portion of that being mainly diet pills. The only two known appetite suppressants were fenfluramine and phenermine, but they didn't prove to be largely effective. However, one doctor, Michael Van Traub, decided to combine them and make a new miracle weight loss drug in the 1970s called Fen Fen. At first, it appeared to work wonders. A single study of 120 patients over four years terrible study size, just saying, saw the majority of female patients lose an average of 30 pounds. There were apparently no side effects, but no one was actually studying their hearts. It was introduced in 1992 and it swept the nation. After a rough debate, the FDA approved it, but in 1996, things went bad. Almost like perfect timing. 24 women taking the pills developed serious heart problems and soon hundreds more were reported. Because of this severe oversight, the American Home and Products Corporation, inventors of Fen Fen, had to pay $3.75 billion settlement. 50,000 more settlement cases were filed. So much for a quick fix, eh? Number seven, radium. I learned about this recently through a series of lists and I still can't believe it. Radium is a radioactive substance that we know now can cause a series of life-threatening complications after repeated exposure. But in the late 19th and early 20th century, this stuff was used for everything. From skincare to toothpaste and water, this stuff was put in everything. From as early as 1896, the effects radium had against cancer were noticed, but soon it became a cure-all for most things like diabetes, rheumatism, and even impotence. As a result, a massive radium industry in the 1920s boomed, and soon you could find it on every shelf in the pharmacy. It was even recommended to drink a glass of water with radium in it because it was good for your health. But then people started to notice some pretty serious side effects such as, I don't know, organs failing, muscle and bone deterioration, you know, all the things radioactive exposure does to a person. The period lasted for 25 years, but by the time World War II hit, the product was considered dangerous. Can I say doctors lied about it if they didn't really know the full effects of the material? Not quite, but at the same time, prescribing something they didn't quite understand doesn't sound very truthful, does it? Number six, the starvation doctor. Got a cold? Starve yourself. Got a depression? Starve yourself. Got cancer? Yeah, don't eat food. Sounds ridiculous, right? Good. Because it is. But to Linda Burfield Hazard, it was the most sensible treatment one could do. Once she gained her medical license through a loophole, Linda preached that strict fasting was the only cure for disease. In her novels, Fasting for the Cure of Disease and Scientific Fasting, the Ancient and Modern Key to Health, she spread her pseudo-scientific message wherever anyone would listen. She believed that all illnesses were a result of excess eating and that you had to starve yourself for months to stave off disease crazy. So she created her own sanitarium where she would only allow patients to drink tomato juice, asparagus juice, and sometimes a teaspoon of orange juice. Ridiculous. Once patients were in her care, if they tried to leave, she would have them declared insane. After 40 patients died, she was finally convicted of manslaughter in 1912 and was sentenced to hard labor. But for some reason, she was pardoned after two years. Then she moved to New Zealand and tried to practice there, but her license was revoked because of lack of credentials. Moral of the story, if someone tells you to starve yourself, make them watch you eat a burrito and smile. Number five, lobotomies. Of course this was gonna be on the list. The miracle procedure invented by Walter Freeman. Finally, there was a way to alleviate the pain and distress of the mentally and emotionally tormented by turning them into vegetables. So not really curing it at all. 
Freeman was an absolute crook of a doctor, though he wasn't seen as one at the time. He developed what was known as the prefrontal lobotomy, a procedure that involved removing a section of the brain. Mm. Early versions involved drilling into the brain, but the new version involved an ice pick through the eye. He would sometimes even use the one he found in his kitchen. Delightful. Freeman's procedure left thousands of patients incapacitated, including one very famous, Rosemary Kennedy, the sister of the future president. More than 15% of his patients died, one during a live broadcast. Despite this, hospitals willingly let him showcase and perform the procedure. Which blows my mind. Freeman was more of a showman than he was a doctor. He drove around in a car he called the Lobotomobile, and then he just performed lobotomies wherever he wanted to. Finally, in 1967, he performed his last surgery on a woman in Berkeley, California. He severed a blood vessel and she died, thus ending his deceptive brain hacking miracle. Number four, yes, sir, Awad. Okay. Gets crazy from here. This one happened back in 2003. When Maria Martinez was just 10 years old, she started having headaches so severe she had to isolate herself away from the light. So she went to a doctor. So she went to the doctor, yes sir, Awad, a pediatric neurologist. He sent her to have an EEG, and Awad came to the conclusion that she was having seizures. Though she had no convulsions, he told her that they were absent seizures, which mostly featured a person kind of mentally checking out, so every time she daydreamed, she thought she was having a seizure. Very subtle, but they do exist. He prescribed her a medication called Lamictal, though Though after several months of the medication, her condition got worse, so he doubled the dose. Skip ahead four years, Martinez gets a second opinion after Awad left his practice. Finds out the whole thing was a lie and that the medication actually causes headaches. She never had seizures. Awad was doing it so he could get more money. She was one of hundreds of patients that Awad intentionally misled. Her case was the first to go on trial and shed a massive light on hospital fraud. Number three, opioids. The opioid crisis remains one of the most devastating pharmaceutical deceptions in history. The Sackler family and their company Purdue Pharma developed a new miracle drug called oxycotin that swept the nation. It was a revolutionary new painkiller that could help patients all over the place, and that it did. The Sackler family racked in $35 billion in sales of the drug, but there was a catch, as there always is. Oxycodone contains oxycodone, a relative to heroin, aka the dragon, which made it two times more powerful than morphine but just as addictive. But Purdue launched a campaign to intentionally mislead their audience in 1996 that said that Oxycontin was safe. Their catchphrase, Oxycontin, the drug to start with and to stay with. But of course, the phrase had deadly consequences. Since 1999, 200,000 people have died due to Oxycontin overdoses. Number two, Jayant Patel. Next up, we have the man known as Dr. Death. Jayant Patel worked in both Australia and the USA and was apparently obsessed with putting people under the knife. He lied about his knowledge and competence and would often perform unnecessary surgeries on people who weren't even his patients. His lies led to the deaths of over 87 people. He was the worst combination of arrogant and stupid. He even performed a colonoscopy backwards. How do you, how do, you do that? You how? Beyond the actual surgeries, he would forge the documents pre and post surgery. It took a strangely long amount of time for him to be caught, even with fellow surgeons calling him out. But finally, he was sentenced to seven years in prison, but was sadly released. <sighs> I hate this, but was sadly released three and a half years after because he had good behavior. Great. Never mind that he killed so many people. The thing that makes me the most angry about this case is that he wasn't the only one who lied. Both of the hospitals he worked at let him perform with dodgy and thin credentials, which means they share the responsibility for those deaths as well. And and last but not least, number one, trial by trachea. Though lab grown organs are slowly becoming reality, it appears they remain too good to be true. Unless you're Paolo Macchiarini, who continues to evade criticism surrounding his artificially grown trachea treatment. In 2011, Paolo shocked the world when he performed the world's first synthetic organ transplant. He replaced the patient's trachea with a plastic tube made perfectly for him. The surgeon gained worldwide fame, so much fame that even his hospital dismissed notions that the medical miracle man wasn't up to snuff. A couple investigations discovered that the foundation for the procedure was weak and that risk analysis wasn't carried out thoroughly. Out of nine patients, seven of them have passed away, but the questions surrounding Paolo mostly criticizes the things that happened prior to surgery. 
Were the patients ill enough that they required such drastic intervention, or was Paolo too eager to gain attention? 